Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and a very good start to 2024. If you enjoy this content, then perhaps you would consider supporting the channel by signing up to the Tudor Chest Patreon account or via Apple Podcast subscriptions, where you can gain access to all of my subscriber episodes that I also release in conjunction with the main show. For as little as £5 a month, your support is what will allow me to continue in running the Tudor Chest and is greatly appreciated. To join, head to patreon.com forward slash the Tudor Chest or search for the podcast on Apple Podcasts from where you can sign up via their subscription services. Elizabeth of York was the first Tudor Queen consort. She was also the firstborn child of two of England's most colourful characters, King Edward IV and his scandalous wife, Elizabeth Woodville. Born into immeasurable wealth and privilege, Elizabeth of York's life was one destined for greatness, and yet her family's innate ability for self-destruction would eventually lead to the throne of England landing in the hands of Elizabeth's sworn enemy and later husband, Henry Tudor. During the short-lived reign of her uncle Richard III, Elizabeth would see her two younger brothers enter the Tower of London, never to be seen again. Well, that is if you don't accept Philippa Langley, of course. With Elizabeth's brothers presumed dead and her cousin the Earl of Warwick imprisoned, Elizabeth became the most senior claimant to the English throne for the remaining Yorkists. But where her sex went against her, it also made her an incredibly valuable marriage prospect. Without Elizabeth of York by his side, Henry Tudor would have struggled greatly to maintain his claim to the throne, which was tenuous at best. Elizabeth would become his queen and give the king several children, the most famous being perhaps the most infamous king in English history, Henry VIII. But who was the real Elizabeth of York and why is her story somewhat overlooked by contemporary historians? Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast, episode 20, Elizabeth of York, England's first Tudor Queen. On the 11th of February, 1466, Queen Elizabeth Woodville went into labour with her first child by her second husband, King Edward IV. The Queen had been married at one time to a Lancastrian who had died fighting against the Yorks by whom she had two sons. This new baby would thus be the Queen's third recorded pregnancy, but as I said a moment ago, it was the first between her and Edward IV. Naturally, everyone hoped that the child would be a boy, a way of shoring up the country's future, but instead the child was a girl, named Elizabeth in honour of her mother. Unlike his grandson Henry VIII, there seems to have been no disappointment from Edward IV that his wife had given birth to a daughter, for he would be a most doting and proud father, and given the couple's youth and Elizabeth Woodville's sons from her former marriage, it was fully believed the sons would follow. Elizabeth of York's christening was celebrated at Westminster Abbey a couple of days later, with both her grandmothers, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, Duchess of Bedford, and Cecily Neville, the Duchess of York, acting as godmothers, and Richard Neville, the 16th Earl of Warwick, as godfather. The decision to name the Earl of Warwick as godfather was likely a deliberate move by the royal couple to try and placate the Earl, for he had been severely put out by Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville, which was done behind his back. Warwick is known to history as the kingmaker for the massive role that he played in helping Edward IV snatch the throne from the incompetent Henry VI, but by marrying Elizabeth, Edward all but destroyed his friendship with England's most powerful nobleman. 18 months after the birth of Elizabeth, she was joined by a sister, Princess Mary, and in the spring of 1469, another sister came along, Princess Cecily. It was also around this time, with Elizabeth aged about three, that she was briefly betrothed to George Neville, who was a nephew of the Earl of Warwick. The young boy was created the Duke of Bedford in anticipation of the marriage, but it was eventually called off when his father, John Neville, supported the Earl of Warwick in his rebellion against King Edward IV. 
1470, the Longford son was born to Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, giving Elizabeth of York and her two sisters their first brother, named Edward in honour of their father. Another daughter, Margaret, was born in 1472, but sadly did not live out the year, to be followed in the summer of 1473 by the couple's second son, Prince Richard, who was born on the 17th of August. He and his older brother Edward would become the two children known to history as the Princes in the Tower. In 1475, King Louis XI of France agreed to a marriage between the nine-year-old Elizabeth of York and his son and heir, Charles, the Dauphin of France. The intended union was upheld for seven years before being broken up in 1482 following the French king's decision to renege on aspects of the agreed deal. The next big thing in the young princess's life came at the age of 11, when she was named a Lady of the Garter in 1477, alongside her mother the Queen and her paternal aunt, Elizabeth of York, Duchess of Suffolk. Now the title of Lady of the Garter was essentially the female equivalent of the Order of the Garter, which is and remains the oldest order of chivalry in the world, having started all the way back in 1348 by King Edward III. Now, the title Lady of the Garter wasn't seen as totally equal in terms of rank, and it would not be until 1987, during the reign of the late Queen Elizabeth II, that the title changed to Lady Companion of the Garter, giving it equal importance to the title bestowed on men. Elizabeth Woodville would go on to give her husband a further four children during their marriage, three more girls and a third prince, George, who sadly died in infancy. Edward IV was a very popular king. He was beloved of the people, particularly in London and the South East, and it's easy to see why. I've always had a massive soft spot for him, and no, it's not entirely down to Max Irons, although that, that plays a role. He was famously easygoing, he was affable, and he was fun to be around. He was also, in his youth, reportedly very, very handsome, and he towered over the rest of the court, standing an impressive six foot three, when the average height of a man at the time was five foot six. Elizabeth Woodville was also a great beauty. In fact, it was said that she was the most beautiful woman in England at the time. And indeed, it was Elizabeth's stunning looks, so legend claims, that so enraptured Edward IV that he proposed marriage to her almost on the spot of their first meeting. Edward had his vices, though, one of which being women, but a more destructive issue was his love of good food and plenty of drink. This is the man who, after all, was the grandfather of Henry VIII. Although he was in robust health for most of his youth, by his late 30s, Edward IV had grown very overweight. On the 9th of April 1483, he died, quite unexpectedly having caught a chill whilst out fishing. He was just 40 years old. In his dying moments, the king entrusted the care of his eldest son, Prince Edward, into the hands of the boy's uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, Edward IV's younger brother. Now, this caused significant disquiet among the Woodville faction headed up by the Queen, for she had expected her brother to be named as the custodian of the prince. Given the new king's youth, it was decided that Richard of Gloucester would be appointed regent and would act as protector of the young king, now known as Edward V, until he came to maturity and would rule independently. Gloucester soon took steps to isolate his nephews from their Woodville relations, including their own mother, the Queen Dowager, and their sisters. He started by intercepting Edward V, whilst the latter was travelling from Ludlow, where he had been living as Prince of Wales, headed towards London, where he would be crowned King of England. Edward V was placed in the royal residence of the Tower of London, ostensibly for his protection, whilst his uncle Anthony Woodville and half-brother Richard Grey who had been escorting him, were arrested and sent to Pontefract Castle in Yorkshire, where, despite promises of safe conduct, were nonetheless beheaded on Richard's orders. Now fearing for her own life and that of her children's, Elizabeth Woodville fled into sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. Richard of Gloucester soon requested that Elizabeth release her second son into his custody, supposedly on the basis that the boy would reside in the Tower of London and keep his brother Edward company. Elizabeth Woodville, under duress and no doubt dreading what might happen, eventually agreed. Two months later, on the 22nd of June 1483, King Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was declared invalid. It was claimed that Edward IV had, at the time of his marriage, already been betrothed to Lady Eleanor Butler. 
Parliament issued a bill, a titular regis, royal title, in support of this position, although no doubt it was under intense pressure from Richard of Gloucester. This measure legally illegitimised the children of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, making them technically ineligible for the throne, and in so doing, Richard was declared as the rightful King of England. The succession rights to the two children born to the middle of the York brothers, George, Duke of Clarence, these being Margaret Pole, later the Countess of Salisbury, and her brother, Edward, Earl of Warwick, were also overlooked, despite the fact that under the laws of primogeniture, they actually held a greater claim to the throne than their uncle, who conveniently decided that their late father's attainder also admitted their right to wear the crown, even though there was no precedence for that. Gloucester thus acceded to the throne as Richard III on the 6th of July 1483, and the two young men now lodged in the tower, his nephews Edward and Richard, disappeared soon after. Although they are perpetually known as the princes in the tower, a more accurate moniker would actually be the king and the prince in the tower, although I appreciate it doesn't really have the same ring to it. Since their disappearance over 500 years ago, exactly what happened to them is still hotly debated, Indeed, very recently, a major documentary aired, led by Philippa Langley of Finding Kings in Car Park's fame, trying to prove that the boys actually escaped the tower, reached adulthood, and made attempts to win back the crown. Others maintain that the boys were quietly murdered inside the tower's walls on the orders of their uncle, King Richard III. Elizabeth's response to her brother's disappearance is not recorded, and as best I can tell, it was not something that she openly discussed in later life. Given how close the family appeared to be, however, let us assume that she would have been deeply saddened by what had happened, particularly with her younger brother, who had been brought up alongside her. Exactly how the proposed marriage alliance between Elizabeth of York and the last hope of the beleaguered Lancastrians, Henry Tudor, came about is not definitively proven. There is actually only one source, and it is Polydor Virgil, so it's a pretty big source, who recorded that it was orchestrated via an agreed alliance between Margaret Beaufort, the mother of Henry Tudor, and the Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville. And Margaret Beaufort had been quietly plotting the return of her son to England shores for some time. As I say, it's only Virgil who makes this claim, but it does feel entirely plausible, if not likely. Although Henry Tudor was descended from King Edward III, his claim to the throne was incredibly weak. Firstly, it came through the female line, which immediately made it less desirable. But more importantly was the fact that via an Act of Parliament, which had been passed during the reign of Richard II in the 1390s, it barred the accession to the throne of any heirs of Henry VII's great-great-grandparents, John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford. Quite literally, Henry and his family were barred from the line of succession. Now, whether such an unprecedented act actually had the force of law is disputed, but even so, there were other legitimate Lancastrian lines into the royal houses of Portugal and Castile, which under close inspection were senior to Henry Tudor's, and as such, rather hilariously, Henry VII's later daughter-in-law, Catherine of Aragon, actually held a better claim to the throne of England than he did. Now, whatever the merits or lack thereof of Henry's claim, according to Polydor Virgil, his mother and Elizabeth Woodville agreed that he should move to overthrow King Richard III and then seize the throne for himself, and once he had taken it, he would then marry Elizabeth of York to boost his feeble claim. This union would also, everyone hoped, bring an end to the period known as the Wars of the Roses. In December 1483, in the Cathedral of Rennes, Henry Tudor swore an oath promising to marry Elizabeth of York and began the preparations for his invasion of England. In 1484, Elizabeth of York and her sisters left Westminster Abbey and returned to court when Elizabeth Woodville was apparently reconciled with Richard III. Now, this may or may not suggest that Elizabeth Woodville by this stage believed that Richard III was innocent of any possible role in the murder of her two sons, and certainly that is the conclusion which Ricardians prescribe to, and I must admit that it is a pretty compelling argument, but equally Elizabeth may have accepted that she had no other choice if she wanted her daughters to regain positions at court. She had many daughters to consider. There were even rumours that Richard III intended to marry Elizabeth of York himself because his wife, Anne Neville, was dying and they had no surviving children, their son, Prince Edward of Middleham, having died around the age of 10. 
Now, although marriage between second or third cousins was not uncommon at the time, marriage between an uncle and his niece most definitely was. And so Richard III was forced to deny the unsavoury rumour, even going to the steps of sending Elizabeth away from the court to his castle of Sheriff Hutton. Richard's wife, Queen Anne, died aged 28 around this time. As the king was still a relatively young man, he was in his early 30s, he sought another marriage and opened negotiations with King John II of Portugal to marry his sister, Joan, Princess of Portugal, and at the same time to have Elizabeth of York marry their cousin, the future King Manuel I of Portugal. Henry Tudor and his army landed in Wales on the 7th of August 1485 and marched inland. On the 22nd of August, Henry Tudor and Richard III fought at the Battle of Bosworth Field. The expected future of England was irrevocably altered, for despite Richard III having the larger army, he lost, for he was betrayed by one of his most powerful retainers, William Stanley, and therefore died in battle. Henry Tudor took the crown by right of conquest as Henry VII, making him the last English king to win the crown in battle. Though initially slow to keep his promise, Henry VII acknowledged the necessity of marrying Elizabeth of York to ensure the stability of his rule and weaken the claims of the other surviving members of the House of York. Where the Tudors counted Henry and his mother, the Yorks were abundant, and so it was important that the new king neutralise the threats posed to his rule. It was also clear to the king that his intended wife, truly was the greatest choice for both the stability of the country, but also in the eyes of the people that he sought to govern. Elizabeth was beloved by the English people, who fondly remembered her father. She represented a continuation of that time, and was unquestionably noble and English. We must keep in mind that Henry Tudor had spent most of his life outside of England, and initially spoke English with a marked French accent. In fact, he actually preferred speaking French at the start of his reign. Even so, Henry wished to be seen as ruling in his own right, having claimed the throne by right of conquest and not by his marriage to the de facto heiress of the House of York. In short, the king wanted to project an image that his rule was not by virtue of his marriage, but in his own right, and that the marriage to Elizabeth of York was a mere practicality. He had no intention of sharing power, as evidenced by his decision to have his coronation take place before his marriage to Elizabeth of York. One positive step that Henry VII made for his wife was to have the Act of Titulus Regis repealed, thereby legitimising anew the children of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville and acknowledging Edward V as his predecessor. Now, this wasn't an act with zero self-interest, however, for it directly affected Henry VII himself, given that he wanted to have children by Elizabeth. Though Richard III was regarded as a usurper, his reign was not ignored. Henry and Elizabeth required a papal dispensation to wed because of canon law, frowning upon their affinity as distant cousins. Henry descended from John of Gaunt and Elizabeth via Gaunt's older brother, Lionel, and via his younger brother, Edmund. It was these complexities of descent from Edward III that were the basis for the Wars of the Roses. Thankfully for the couple, the marriage was approved by papal bull by Pope Innocent VIII. Cardinal Bouchier, Archbishop of Canterbury, officiated at the wedding of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York on the 18th of January 1486. Beyond the date of the wedding, little to no details are recorded about the actual day. In contrast to Henry VII's most famous portrait, in which he appears to have quite a pronounced squint and an overall hangdog expression, in his youth he was recorded as being quite handsome. He was tall and slim, with dark hair, and his bride prescribed extravagantly to the beauty conventions of the time. She was fair-skinned, with yellow blonde hair and blue eyes. She was the perfect English rose. Standing at five foot six, she was also relatively tall for a woman at the time, with the average height for women at this time being around five foot. She was also famed for her sweet nature and ease among all types of people. She was, after all, the daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, two people who had charisma coming out of them in spades. Just eight months into their marriage, on the 20th of September 1486, Elizabeth of York performed her core duty as queen, giving birth to a healthy male heir, Prince Arthur. As he came along eight months into the marriage, it raises the tantalising prospect 
that Henry VII and Elizabeth of York slept together prior to their marriage, with some historians suggesting that Henry wanted to test the fertility of his intended wife before actually taking her down the aisle. Equally, of course, there is the argument that the couple had been married under canon law for some time, and so Henry was not pushing the boundaries of what was deemed appropriate. We should also consider that maybe the Queen just had her son prematurely. A little over a year later, on the 25th of November 1487, Elizabeth of York was finally crowned Queen of England. We have a lot more information available to us regarding Elizabeth's coronation than we do with regard to her wedding day. It was recorded that the Duke of Bedford was selected as Lord Steward of the day itself, the Earl of Oxford would act as the Queen's Chamberlain, and the Duke of Suffolk would carry the Queen's scepter. The day before the coronation took place, Elizabeth was escorted in a grand procession to the Tower of London, with a canopy of state held above her, carried by twelve knights, one of whom was Sir Richard Pole, who would be married to one of the most senior female Yorkists, Margaret, the daughter of the Duke of Clarence. On the day of the coronation itself, the Queen's train was carried by her sister, Princess Cecily, who after Elizabeth was the most senior Yorkist in terms of rank, and her crown was carried by Jasper Tudor, Duke of Bedford, an uncle to the King. Not everything on the day went to plan, however. Indeed, a great skirmish broke out over the ray cloth, which was the long fabric that the procession had walked on. At such occasions, it was traditional that after the procession had come to its end, the ray cloth would then be cut up and given to lowly spectators and kept as a sort of keepsake from the day. Now, for some reason on this day, however, the crowd basically decided that they would start ripping the cloth up whilst it was still being used and it caused great trouble for the queen's ladies who were described as being much broken and distroubled by the crowd basically attempting to snatch the the cloth that they were walking on the press of people trying desperately to get part of the shredded cloth got so severe that it actually resulted in some fatalities as was customary the king did not participate actively in the coronation of his wife but instead watched the proceedings from a raised stage seated alongside his mother and the Queen's cousin, Lady Margaret of Clarence, who, as I mentioned a moment ago, would eventually marry Sir Richard Pole. Two women not present at the coronation were people that Elizabeth must surely have wanted to be there nonetheless. They were her mother, the Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville, and her elderly grandmother, Cecily Neville, the mother of King Edward IV. Despite their marriage being a political arrangement, if the records are accurate, then it would appear that both partners slowly fell in love with each other. Historian Thomas Penn, in his biography of Henry VII, wrote that, though founded on pragmatism, Henry and Elizabeth's marriage had nevertheless blossomed throughout the uncertainty and upheaval of the previous 18 years. This was a marriage of faithful love of mutual attraction, affection and respect, from which the king seems to have drawn great strength. Henry VII was not a naturally easygoing man. He did not carry the devil-may-care nature of his wife's father, but crucially he did understand the importance of pageantry, especially in the early days of his reign when it was so crucial to the establishment of his new dynasty. To distinguish himself as more secure in his reign than his predecessors, he valued demonstrating his vast wealth to foreign ambassadors, particularly from France and Spain. Queen Elizabeth, who, being born royal, was flawless in her understanding and knowledge of royal court etiquette, and therefore acted as a safe pair of hands for the king to deputise to. It was she and her indomitable mother-in-law who would shape the court's outward appearance, for Henry VII still felt like something of an outsider, having lived outside of England since the age of 14. In order to maintain the stability and peace their marriage created, the new Tudor dynasty needed to also put an end to the ongoing quarrelling between the remaining members of the Yorkist and Lancastrian families. Their solution was an old one, marriage. The eldest of the Queen's sisters, Cecily and Anne of York, and their cousin Margaret, were deemed to be the biggest threat, and so they were married off to Lancastrian men who were loyal to Henry, his mother, and Tudor interests. The problem for these remaining doyens of the Yorkist dynasty was that they greatly outranked their respective bridegrooms, and this is seen most glaringly in the marriage between Margaret of Clarence and Sir Richard Pole. As a niece of two of England's kings, Margaret had been brought up in extreme wealth and had expected to marry someone appropriate to her rank. Sir Richard Pole, whilst a decent and kind man, was not deemed suitable by the Yorkists, and it isn't difficult to see why. His annual income was a mere £50 a year. 
compared to the £6,000 a year that Margaret's father had enjoyed. Money has become synonymous with King Henry VII's reign. He was famously parsimonious, often checking all expenditure by the royal household personally, and through clever, albeit despised, taxation, by his death the royal coffers were practically bursting. It is untrue, however, to suggest that he was unwilling to spend money on his family. Indeed, quite the opposite was true, for he was willing to spend lavishly on his wife and children and his mother, and would often pay off debts run up by Elizabeth out of his own funds. These debts were fairly frequent, for Elizabeth had a great love of fashion and spent extravagantly throughout her tenure as queen. This is unsurprising, for she was, after all, as royal as it's possible to be, and was used to having the very best of everything right from the moment of her birth. Elizabeth was also a very pious woman, and one of her life's passions was charity, one of the three theological virtues of the Catholic Church. She gave away vast sums of money in very large quantities, all of which carrying the king's blessing. She also gave generously to monks and religious orders. What also went massively in Elizabeth's favour as far as the king was concerned was her fecundity. She did what every English medieval queen was expected to do and produced an ample brood of children. That said, it wasn't all plain sailing for a second child did not come along till over three years after Prince Arthur's birth in 1486 when in November 1489 a second child, Princess Margaret, was born. 18 months later, a second son was born to the couple, named Henry, in honour of his father, and just 13 months later, another princess was born to the couple, who they named Elizabeth, in honour of the Queen and her mother before her. Sadly, the little Princess Elizabeth died in September 1495, aged just three. Although a relatively hollow silver lining, at the time of the princess's death, the Queen was once again pregnant, and gave birth to another daughter, Mary, in March of 1496. Princess Mary would mark the couple's final child to outgrow infancy. Two more pregnancies did take place, with a son, Prince Edmund, born in February 1499, who died the following year, and then Catherine, born in 1503, who lived for a matter of days. The records state that Elizabeth spent much of her time when not at court at the places that were the nurseries of her children. Within a year of the Battle of Bosworth, a friend of Henry Tudor, Thomas Lovell, began expanding and improving upon the Elsingham property to make it fit for Elizabeth, her husband and her children, and it was completed by the time of Prince Henry with inner and outer courts and ample places for the princes and princesses to play. This was largely done as a gift but it was completed in the newer Renaissance style and in time was suitable enough for Henry and Elizabeth's grandchildren and proves it was a much-loved refuge for the king and his wife. More recent evidence also suggests that Henry VII was as much a builder as his son Henry VIII and granddaughter Elizabeth I, and that his wife shared in that interest. It is known now, for example, that Elizabeth of York had a hand in designing the former Greenwich Palace, and that the palace itself was well appointed for large-scale entertaining. Records are also very clear that Christmas was a raucous and special time for the royal family on the whole, evidenced by the many surviving documents depicting a particularly lively court having a marvellous time, with copious amounts of imported wine, great amounts of money spent upon roasted meats and entertainment. Henry VII also frequently bought gifts for Elizabeth and their children, although they did not actually spend Christmas Day in each other's company, despite being under the same roof. Their gifts to each other would be presented by servants, and the couple would dine separately with their smaller retinue of attendants. One relationship that has been the subject of much debate with regard to Elizabeth of York is that between her and her mother-in-law, Lady Margaret Beaufort. Because of Margaret Beaufort's force of nature, it has been argued that Elizabeth of York was unable to exercise as much political influence as Queen as she would have liked. Certainly it was commented on that Margaret Beaufort walked a mere half pace behind her daughter-in-law at state occasions and even went to the length of signing documents as Margaret R for Margaret Regina, although it's possible it referred to Margaret Richmond, although I'm pretty sure she meant Margaret Regina. For Elizabeth of York, it must have felt at times like there were two queens in England, and due to Henry VII's devotion to his mother, it must have been challenging. But equally, the evidence also suggests that the two women worked together for the greater good of the family, a key example being when they blocked Princess Margaret travelling to Scotland at a young age to conclude her marriage to King James IV of Scotland. 
There were also instances where Elizabeth prevailed over the influence of her mother-in-law, including when Henry VII chose to appoint Elizabeth's choice for a vacant bishopric over his mother's selection, showing Henry's affection for and willingness to listen to his wife. Elizabeth seems to have had a love of books, patronising the English printer William Caxton. She also enjoyed the typically female pursuits of needlework, music and dancing, and also a spot of gambling. The last of these was a pastime that she actually shared with her mother-in-law, with the king having to pay off both his mother and his wife's debts on several occasions. As queen, Elizabeth made arrangements for the education of her younger children, including the future Henry VIII, who it was said idolised his mother. Comparisons of their handwriting show that they had a very similar hand, suggesting that Elizabeth may have taught her son to read and write herself. She also accompanied her husband on diplomatic visits to Calais in 1500 to meet with Philip I of Castile, and she corresponded with Queen Isabella I of Castile before the marriage of Prince Arthur to the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon. The wedding of the heir to the Tudor throne took place on the 14th of November 1501 in the original St Paul's Cathedral. The pair were then sent to Ludlow Castle, the traditional residence of the Prince of Wales, where Arthur would preside, a good training exercise for his future role as King of England. Elizabeth looked to her own family to support her eldest child, with Margaret Pole and her husband as the head of Arthur's household. Sadly, disaster struck when just five months later, Arthur died at the age of just 15. The news of Arthur's death caused Henry VII to break down in grief, so much so that in that moment Elizabeth summoned enough courage to comfort her husband, telling him that he was the only child of his mother, but had survived to become the king, that God had left him with a son and two daughters, and that they were both young enough to have more children. When she returned to her own chambers, however, Elizabeth herself broke down in grief. Her attendants sent for the king, who in turn comforted her. Elizabeth's words to her husband would turn out to be highly prescient, for just weeks after Arthur's death, Elizabeth would fall pregnant again. She was by now, however, 36 years old, which was approaching middle age by the standards of the time, and was likely to be her last pregnancy. She chose to spend her confinement period in the Tower of London. On the 2nd of February 1503, she gave birth to a daughter, Princess Catherine. Now, whether the birth was traumatic or the Queen's aftercare was wanting, she soon grew dangerously ill with a postpartum infection. Elizabeth of York died on the 11th of February 1503, her 37th birthday. Immediately, the court went into deep mourning, with her family nothing short of devastated at her loss. According to one biographer, the death of Elizabeth broke the heart of her husband and shattered him. Further grief was soon upon the king, however, for the little girl that Elizabeth had brought into the world also died, possibly just before her mother or a few days afterwards. Sadly, we have no confirmed date of death for Princess Catherine. Further evidence of just how badly the family of Elizabeth of York took her death was unearthed in 2012 when the Vaux Passionale, an illuminated manuscript that was once the property of Henry VII, was rediscovered in the National Library of Wales. It depicts the aftermath of Elizabeth's death vividly. Henry VII is shown receiving the book containing the manuscript in mourning robes with a doleful expression on his face. What is more telling, however, is what's going on in the background, for behind their father are the late Queen's surviving daughters, Princesses Margaret and Mary, wearing customary black veils, but also a small figure of a young red-headed boy, the 11-year-old Prince Henry, who is shown with his head and his hands weeping into the sheets of his mother's empty bed. The depth of Henry VII's grief is also highlighted in the amount of money that he spent in his late wife's funeral, which was estimated as being around £3,000, or roughly £2 million by modern standards, compared to the £600 that was spent on the funeral of his eldest son, Arthur, Prince of Wales, the previous year. Following ten days of lying in state at the Tower, the Queen's remains were conveyed to Westminster Abbey using the very same route that was used in coronation ceremonies. Her coffin, topped with an effigy of Elizabeth, wearing her robes of estate and crown, and holding her sceptre, was placed on cushions of black velvet and blue cloth of gold in a carriage. The carriage was escorted by knights bearing banners displaying the royal arms and images of saints and the parents of the king and queen. 
The head of the procession started with around 200 poor people bearing torches, who were then followed by members of the royal household, the mayor of London, and so on. As custom dictated, neither the king nor any of his children would attend the funeral in person. When the procession reached Westminster Abbey, the coffin was placed on a hearse decorated with black cloth of gold, emblazoned with the Queen's motto, humble and reverent, before it lay in state overnight. In the Queen's chambers, a meal was given which was presided over by her sister, Princess Catherine of York. Catherine would also act as the chief mourner at the funeral which took place on the 23rd of February. The Bishop of London blessed the grave, the effigy was removed from the coffin and then the coffin was lowered into the grave. The Queen's officers then broke their staffs of office and threw them into the grave, symbolising the end of their service to Elizabeth of York. Elizabeth was initially buried in a side chapel and not in what is now her final resting place. When her husband died six years later, he and Elizabeth were buried within a vault inside the Henry VII Lady Chapel. A magnificent tomb was erected with gilt bronze effigies of the couple showing them in joint prayer and that can still be seen to this day. After his wife's death, many of the less savoury characteristics of Henry VII's personality came into full being, in particular his obsession with money. By his death, he may have made England richer than it had been in living memory, but at the cost of the love of his people, which they had always held so fervently for his late wife. Henry VII died, mourned by few, and was succeeded by his son, Prince Henry, who aside from being Elizabeth of York's favourite, also seemed to be her father born again, standing a strapping six foot three, broad in shoulder, boasting quintessential Yorkist good looks and an endearing personality, quite removed from the miser that his father had become. No one could have ever predicted just how much Henry VIII would change over time, and none would have been more shocked by his actions than his own mother, particularly in the cruel treatment that he meted out on members of Elizabeth of York's own family, most prominently Lady Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury. It is also thanks to her son's many queen consorts that Elizabeth of York's position as the first Tudor queen consort is invariably eclipsed by what came later, with the dramas of Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn and the rest. And yet, Elizabeth of York's life was monumental and extraordinary. Margaret Beaufort is often called the mother of the Tudor dynasty, but Elizabeth is the person who brought harmony to a war-ravaged kingdom. She was the daughter of a king, the sister of a king, the niece of a king, the wife of a king, the mother of a king, grandmother to a king, and also to the first two queens regnant in English history, let alone her position as great-grandmother to Lady Jane Grey and Mary, Queen of Scots. Her descendants remain on the throne of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth and several other European royal families to this day. And so that brings me to the end of this week's episode of the Tudor Chess Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, I will return to full programming with my bonus subscriber episode coming out on Tuesday, which will explore some of the lost treasures of Tudor England as I unpack the former residences and now lost parts of palaces such as the Tower of London, Hampton Court, and the entirely lost Nonsuch Palace. Thank you again for listening, and speak soon.